everybody. Good day to you, wherever you are around the globe. Welcome to our third webinar in the series, and we are delighted to provide this overview of the ISO 55000 series of asset management, management standards on World Standards Day. The theme for this year's World Standards Day is protecting the planet with standards. Standards provide a common language and allow us to share our expertise. As we think about the challenges of 2020, we should also consider the opportunities for improving our resilience, management and impact through collaboration, standardization and continual improvement. My name is Chris Roberts. <clears throat> I'm the national lead for asset management in the United States and I'm a contributing author of the International Standard for Asset Management, ISO 55001. I'm also the deputy president of the Institute of Asset Management. With me today, I have speakers from the WSP business across the globe. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. I'll start with Wayne Hatcher from New Zealand. Hey, good day, everybody. Um, my name is Wayne Hatcher. I'm technical director for asset management uh, based in uh, New Zealand. Toby Horstead from Australia. Yeah, good day. Good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Toby Horstead. I'm a senior principal consultant asset management in Australia. Uh, I'm also a director on the board of the Asset Management Council within Australia. And Tiffany Batak from the USA. Good day, everyone. My name is Tiffany Batak. I'm assistant vice president and asset management principal consultant based in the US. I currently serve as deputy convener for Working Group 7, whose focus is to develop ISO 55011. It's a forthcoming international standard to aid in the development and enhancement of existing public policy as it relates to asset management. Thank you. So today we plan to run through the ISO 55000 set of standards, why they exist, what they are, who's using them, and what benefits they provide. We will hold questions to the end, and if you do have a question, please use the chat facility within the application. Let's start with why they exist. Asset management is more about using uh, assets to deliver value and achieve organizational goals and objectives. It's more than just maintaining an asset, but instead demonstrating linkage between customer needs and asset investments. The need for an asset management standard came about in the late 1990s and early 2000s and largely on the back of privatized uh, industries being pushed by regulators to show how they would deliver customer service. And that was um, really picked up in the UK, Australia and, and a number of other um, markets and around the globe where social infrastructure was being privatized. But it's also because of the need for that private investment and the insurance aspects in social of infrastructure that have really driven the need for a standard. In all instances, the industry's needs explicitly led to setting out requirements resulting in a, a history of development that we've seen over the last two decades. Starting with UK regulated industry calling for that support and asking for a common language back in 2002, which resulted in the British Standards Institute's publicly available specification um, for asset management, um, PAS 55, published in 2004. And from that, an ongoing um, process of, of review and continual development as the standard was further taken up across the globe. PAS 55 was one of the most successful British standards ever produced, and ISO 55001 has followed suit standard that is now published um, in 15 um, languages across across the globe and is used by over 100 countries. So what is the standard? What is it providing us? Um, to answer this, I've asked Tiffany Batak, a key contributor to its ongoing development, who will provide an overview of the, the current set of standards. Thank you, Chris. Um, just for some context setting, um, from the previous slide, the transition from a PC to a TC is a significant one, and it really illustrates the demand and or need for this series of standards to exist. 
Before we go into what ISO 55001 is, I'd first like to highlight the level of global intellectual capital that goes into the development of these international standards. For Technical Committee 251, responsible for the ISO 55000 suite of asset management standards, we currently have about 35 participating member countries, which you can see highlighted here um, in blue on this map, and an additional 18 observing member countries highlighted in orange on the same map. For anyone participating in this call who has taken part in the development of an international standard, you know that there is a high level of rigorous international review by experts in the field and a series of stages and ballots a document must get through before it can become an international standard. And even when it does become a standard, it undergoes a five-year review and update cycle. So let's get back to ISO 55000 series of standards and what they are. On this next slide, uh, we have ISO 55000, 55001, and 55002, uh, which are the standards, were the first set of standards published in 2014 that define asset management principles and a management system approach applicable to delivery organizations. 55,000 provides an overview of asset management, asset management principles, and sets the groundwork for the terminology used throughout the series. 55,001 is the requirement standard, and the standard that should you choose to become certified, this is the standard you would certify it against. 55,002 serves as, as guidance for implementation of the management system standard 55001, and it has since been updated and republished as of 2018. Now, in smaller organizations, there may not be an official management system per se, maybe just our way of doing things. But in larger organizations, procedures need to be recorded so that everyone is clear on who does what, and everyone is clear on expectations and requirements to ensure services are delivered each and every day, whether that is delivering transportation services, water, power, etc. The process of systemizing how things are done is called a management system. It captures the processes and procedures you use to ensure that you can undertake all tasks to safely deliver service. It starts with defining the organizational context and understanding the needs and expectations of stakeholders, defining leadership, roles and responsibilities, asset management objectives, and a plan for how assets will be managed, maintained, operated, and having adequate support and resources, both human and financial resources to meet the asset and asset management objectives and a plan for performance evaluation and continual improvement. It's important to note that ISO 55001 defines requirements for what to do or what you should do, but not how to do it. I'll give you a few examples. It will help you to align asset activities to organizational goals and objectives and provide a structure for an asset management system. But it won't tell you what the requirements are for and not to be confused with an enterprise asset management IT system, for example, or tell you what data you should be collecting and at what frequency. It will help you establish a consistent approach to decision making and enable you to make data back decisions with transparency so you can justify the resources needed for your assets. But it won't tell you what your measures should be. It will help establish controls for managing assets and at the organizational level while instilling processes to better understand asset needs. But it won't tell you what you need to fix, when, and how to improve your maintenance, for example. Now we'll talk about who is using this standard. Thanks, Tiffany. 
So as Tiffany's described, a standard for a management system, um, importantly, like all management systems, um, you're able to certify to it or to demonstrate compliance. That's not the, the only use of the system, and we'll explore how um, other organisations are using it across the globe in a moment. Before we do, I wanted to just touch on who is actually using the standard. Um, while there is no central database of all users of the standard, or, or, or a central database of all those who've been certified to the standard, we have here collected a limited sample. It's no surprise that the largest take-up is in the countries with heavier regulation. Over 70% of the take-up is in the management of social infrastructure, either by public entities or by the private sector. And of that 70%, 49% of that is with heavy regulated utilities like the water, wastewater uh, and power sectors across the globe, in particular focused around UK, Europe and Australasia. Very little take up in the private sector to date, or at least in the sample that we got, we've been able to um, collate here. We are very aware that there has been a huge use of the standard in the oil and gas um, and in the manufacturing sectors, and the take up continues on a global basis. Um, North America, for example, little, very little use right now or very little certification right now, but we are seeing more and more organizations adopting the standard and taking it up on a very wide scale. With such a wide take up, let's look at how it is being applied, not just for certification, but also how it's being used to drive performance improvement across the, the globe. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Toby. Uh, thank you, Chris. So just looking at the, the Australian environment and particularly regulated entities, regulated utilities in Australia are required to be certified to ISO 55001 as part of industry regulation, the operating licence or indeed pricing regulation. Uh, examples of this are Sydney Water, Transgrid and Western Power. Indeed, the application of asset management has turned poles and wires, the poles and wires of Ausgrid from a liability to a $16 billion sale for the New South Wales government. From a rail point of view, rail safety legislation actually requires an organisation to have an asset management policy and processes in place for all phases of the asset life cycle of the rail infrastructure or rolling stock, but it doesn't require certification. Considering the state governments across Australia, the common across all state governments, with the exception of Western Australia, is that they reference or seek alignment to 55001 no state governments mandate certification. In New South Wales and Victoria, they have been by far the most active in outwardly expressing asset management as a key to ensuring service outcomes are achieved. The Asset Management Accountability Framework in Victoria, that's enforced by standing directions of the Minister for Finance uh, made under the Financial Management Act. Um, this uh, Asset Management Accountability Framework is aligned to ISO 55001. Chris? Thanks, Toby. So just as in the in the Australian um, position, we've also got examples across the globe, the UK with the regulation of the water, wastewater um, and energy sector. And here an example from the United States with the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, the federal, uh, the federal um, uh, funding and authorization bill, which sets requirements for asset management, including both the requirements for asset management plans, key part of the ISO standard and also the requirements for an implementation strategy defined very much as setting out the practices and um, the schedules the accountability so that management system approach for all of the uh, transportation infrastructure or at least the surface transportation infrastructure in the United States. Um, I'll hand it back to Toby um, to talk a little bit about um, an application of the standard uh, outside of pure regulation. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I was talking about the state governments before, but let's just have a, a closer look at the New South Wales state government in Australia. Um, New South Wales has focused more on capability and improvement rather than compliance in, in the application of asset management. Um, there is an, uh, an asset management policy for government that has been released for the public sector and has the core requirements of alignment to New South Wales government asset management principles, that you should have an asset management framework, 
Uh, and it does talk about compliance and disclosure, but this is really about attesting to having a robust system to manage your assets. Uh, the asset management policy seeks to align agency core asset management practices with the internationally recognised approaches contained within 55001. Agencies are not expected to seek independent accreditation against 55001 in order to comply with the new asset management policy. And while this doesn't restrict agencies seeking certification, agencies are, are actually encouraged to assess whether there are the benefits, uh, whether the benefits of accreditation actually outweigh the costs. If an agency does choose to seek independent accreditation, it is essential to consider that compliance with the asset management policy doesn't guarantee accreditation to the standard. And conversely, accreditation to the standard doesn't guarantee compliance with the uh, elements of the asset management policy. So in New South Wales, it has very much been uh, about capability building, confidence and assurance that assets are and, and will be fit to deliver services. It is about the outcomes for the state not compliance or necessarily certification. The leaders within government have externally expressed the desire for greater focus on lifting the government capability and to ensure that asset management is, a, is at the leadership table within the government agencies. Through our Asset Management Council roles um, uh, in Australia, we have been facilitating uh, an asset management community practice for New South Wales government that's been running since 2017 with regularly nearly 100 attendees every two or three months. Infrastructure New South Wales has also released guidance material on the web for asset management and are also providing maturity assessments that, that have been partly paid for by the central body. Uh, there is even uh, part of the Infrastructure New South Wales website that is solely dedicated to asset management. We have been working with uh, Infrastructure New South Wales uh, further on, on the New South Wales Asset Management Assurance Framework. Um, supporting the asset management policy. Uh, WSP undertook global research, testing and development of infrastructure performance metrics. We were seeking a set of metrics that allows cross-sector comparison, not just within say transport, but enabling the comparison of condition of school classrooms with rail network or perhaps the opera house. What we have found, this is actually breaking new ground uh, globally and um, we're looking forward to the outcomes of this in New South Wales. Our role has also included the development of a two-stage assurance assessment process. Firstly, a rapid appraisal of 100, some, somewhere around 100 plus agencies to determine the effectiveness and confidence in the systems of that agency, and also to make a risk-based determination of who might go through a deeper dive in a second stage. Um, we have developed uh, the processes and guidance workbook for the assurance framework, and with the New South Wales Asset Management Policy requiring alignment to 55001, the international standard is the backbone of these assurance processes. Importantly, this is not a critical audit approach. Rather, the intent is to provide the agency with the support and improvement opportunities they need, reinforcing that the intent of the policy is to lift capability in asset management and to have the most efficient and effective management of public assets to deliver the societal outcomes that we're after. Chris? Thanks, Toby. So um, I'd also like to ask Tiffany just to walk through how WSP has been applying the standard with some of its clients across the globe, particularly focused on how we're helping clients um, either achieve some of what Toby's just been talking about, which is developing their maturity, or in, in um, several instances, actually helping them um, align themselves to the standard and move forwards ready for certification to that standard. So. Tiffany, can I ask you to walk through that? Sure, thanks, Chris. So as we focus on improving capability, WSP developed and utilizes a method which we call the Asset Management Capability Assessment Model, or AM2C for short. It draws upon over 20 years of experience in managing critical infrastructure, and it is applied globally. The capability assessment model is mapped to global standards, including but not limited to the application of the 55,000 series of standards. It's also mapped to industry best practices and regulatory requirements. Assessment of an organization's asset management capability is based on the degree of formality and optimization of processes and practices. It focuses on eight major pathways to achieve asset management success over five key areas involving number one, people because people do asset management. 
and it requires an organization that works together with competencies and skills mapped in order to transform it. Number two, processes. Both enterprise and asset level processes to effectively and efficiently manage the life cycle of assets and deliver service in a coordinated fashion. Number three, quality asset data and information to improve decision making. Number four, technology to support the capture and integrated management of information, and lastly, mechanisms for continual improvement. The assessment helps identify opportunities to improve organizational capability across 33 subject areas that describe best practice management, asset management, and informs the development and delivery of improvement programs through the pathways approach so that organizations can better prepare for both immediate needs and get future ready. Thanks, Tiffany. It's also worth mentioning actually that the that WSP is in fact a certifying body through the Institute of Asset Management's endorsed assessor scheme, which means we are able to not just help you along your journey to becoming um, ISO compliant, but we're also able to certify. Now, with that, I'd like to just pivot over to looking at the benefits for asset management. I'm gonna ask Wayne to walk us through um, benefits from um, a number of different viewpoints. Wayne, over to you. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to look at the benefits through three lenses. Um, firstly, looking uh, at the social lens, uh, social infrastructure lens. Um, one of the many benefits arise, um, the key ones being uh, through the delivery of consistent uh, services to stakeholders and organisations uh, and, and users of that. Um, this leads to uh, enhanced reputation and organisational confidence. Uh, also, uh, out of uh, implementing a good asset management system, we observe um, improved uh, resilience through understanding risks better, and particularly uh, through that uh, thinking about mitigation and uh, what can be done to uh, respond in, in, in instances of crisis. Uh, also, we are seeing uh, improved transparency, um, leading to uh, just better justification for investment. Um, and, and the benefits that flow from that through through the funding sources, and this leads to all the leads to improve improve financial performance. And for those organisations that uh, um, uh, rely on borrowing or capital investment, particularly, uh, we're seeing uh, risk ratings uh, uh, occurring. Um, also. Uh, through the implementation of asset management system and the involvement um, Wayne, did we did lose we... you there? Yeah. Looks like we've got some connectivity problems with um, New Zealand there. So I'll just jump in um, on this slide and, and Toby, I'm going to ask you for an example in a moment as well, just while we see whether we can get Wayne back online. Um, uh, looks like he's, yeah, he's offline. So as Wayne was talking benefits to social infrastructure, he's, he's picked up on here the improved financial performance, lower borrowing costs, of course, the more that we can demonstrate that we've got a handle on risks, um, we can um, utilize that to demonstrate how we are managing those risks and be a little bit more transparent and reduce our, our bar borrowing costs, I should say. Um, importantly as well though, it does help to bring maintenance and asset management to the boardroom. It helps us to have that common understanding, that common language throughout everything that we're doing and helps us create a greater level of engagement with the workforce. I think one of the big benefits for me with asset management has always been the ability to upsell to the boardroom um, what the issues are, making sure that the boardroom's connected, downsell through the organization to engage the organization and make sure that everybody is aligned. So creating that line of sight, but also cross sell across the organization so that we're engaging different parts of the organization's um, capabilities not just about maintenance, as I said earlier, 
also thinking about HR, thinking about our customer service groups and other groups that are all contributing to the success of the organization. Um, Toby, do you have any examples of uh, benefits to social infrastructure organizations? Yeah, yeah, yes. Thanks, Chris. I certainly do. Um, it's some work we've done in Australia uh, in the power sector. We've been able to demonstrate that going beyond simply having compliance with 55,001, taking that next step beyond compliance, can deliver $3.20 in return for every dollar you spend on improving asset management. And I think you know that's something that the boardroom would be very interested in. Yeah, a very good example. And we've got similar studies um, from the likes of the EPA in, in the USA. Um, in fact, the, the um, General Audit Office as well has done studies on the benefits to social infrastructure and, and reinforce over and over that it's not just about um, money saving, cutting costs, but it's also about some of the other things that we've touched on in this slide. Wayne, are you back online? Got a green light next to your name, but no, I can't hear you. Okay. I'm back a little bit, Chris. So I think it'd be best if you carry on if you can. I can we can hear you if you want to have an attempt, otherwise I'll jump in. Do you want to try? Okay, so the the benefits for private ent uh, entities are, of course, very similar to what we've seen on the social infrastructure side that we've just gone through. In fact, of course, as we discussed earlier, many of those private entities are indeed managing social infrastructure. But for those entities that are managing um, non-social infrastructure, so think of it like manufacturing, mining, et cetera, again, the ability to focus and deliver on organizational goals and objectives to provide that connection from what we're trying to achieve through to um, the investments in the assets themselves can really help um, drive that confidence of investors it creates that transparency it creates a, a a clear line of sight within the organization it enables us to demonstrate where we are investing our money why we're investing our money it enables us to make sure that those investments are indeed the right investments. So we're focusing on the right things to deliver the right levels of service from our assets. Um, all of that enables, all of that transparency enables us to, to drive investor confidence. It enables us to manage risks. It enables us to reduce our insurance premiums, et cetera. And for some organizations, particularly those that are in a more competitive marketplace, it enables us to drive competitiveness. It enables us to reduce the unit cost of what we manufacture, for example, um, which for those organizations is an, an ever going, an, an ongoing battle um, as they try to compete within the marketplace. Um, the last lens that, that Wayne had intended to talk through was the benefits to individuals. Um, I like to talk about this as the um, the well-being or the wellness side of asset management because as I said earlier that ability to connect upwards downwards and across within the organization really does help those that are touching the assets on a day-to-day -day basis sleep better at night it enables us to share those problems that we have within the organization and make sure that we've got credible solutions for those um, issues and challenges Importantly, it creates a common language. That was one of the things that I said at the very start. Uh, a standard is really about establishing a common language. Um, and, and that common language drives industry best practice. It drives um, access to guidance material. You've heard on this call, Toby um, represents the, the Asset Management Council in his spare time, myself representing the Institute of Asset Management in my spare time. Both of those organizations heavily engaged in driving best practice across the globe. It also gives us access to internationally recognized qualifications. The more that is happening in this space, the more there is a recognition that we need to establish qualifications and training, and we need to utilize that um, those qualifications and training to professionalize the discipline of asset management. 
All of that increases our availability of an inter international case studies. It also increases our availability to an international skill set, skills that are transferable between market sectors. Um, and we've seen an awful lot of that across the globe as asset management professionals have moved from managing water or wastewater or power utilities into transportation and into the private sector. That sk those um, transferable skills really do speak to um, what we're trying to achieve when we adopt asset management, which is that connectivity within the organization and that focus on the organization's goals and objectives. So with that, um, I was going to thank Wayne at this point. Um, I'm not going to, to do that because we had a little bit of Wayne. But there we go. Um, I'm going to um, close in a moment and we'll take some questions. But before we do close, um, I'm going to ask Tiffany, who I mentioned earlier, is a convener with the International Standards Technical Committee, to just give us a summary of what's next. What are we expecting to see in the pipeline for the international standard and how does that tie back to some of the challenges that we have today over to you tiffany thank you chris the dialogue for asset management is definitely evolving uh, what we're seeing is an evolution from a focus on asset management requirements especially in regulated sectors to a focus on implementing best practice and improving asset management capabilities as described by toby and demonstrated in the New South Wales example, in order to realize performance, risk, and cost benefits, as well as the benefits to social infrastructure, private entities, and individuals that Wayne and Chris just shared with us. As part of this shift, additional guidance has been developed within TC251 around alignment of asset management, finance, and accounting, and new guidance is being explored for decision-making frameworks, asset registries, as well as new guidance underway for governments and public policy authorities, as we focus not just on individual delivery organizations, but really taking a more broader systems approach, looking across sectors and levels of government. For governments and public policy authorities, Good asset management is a key enabler for those seeking to balance investment in immediate needs with long-term goals in order to achieve desired societal outcomes, whether they may include social equity, resilience, improved health outcomes, or achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In my current capacity as Deputy Convener of Working Group 7, I mentioned that we are focused on developing a new guidance document in this series, ISO 55011. ISO 55011 is intended to help governments and their public policy authorities develop public policy in a way that promotes good asset management, making the best use of limited public resources to realize desired societal outcomes and maximize return on investments. I do wanna point out that Working Group 7 is seeking input from governments and public policy authorities, and we'll be launching a survey at the end of the month to gather input from these audiences. So please do keep a lookout for that if you're interested in contributing to the standard in the series. Information will be distributed through your respective country mirror committees, it will be accessible on our TC251 website. There's a link at the bottom of the screen there, or you can feel free to contact me directly. In recognition of World Standards Day, just wanna thank everyone for your interest in today's session on international standards that help protect the planet like the 55,000 series of standards. Chris, back over to you. Thanks, Tiffany. So with that, we'll bring the, um webinar to a end. We've got um, a, a couple of questions here, which I'll, I'll direct in a moment. Um, but just before I do, just encourage you that if you do have any more questions, please use the chat facility to type those questions up. We'll pick them up and, and answer them over the next few minutes. Um, so I'm going to start with this one. Um, where do you see the biggest value drivers for a company when adopting ISO 55001? And what are the three to five key elements? Uh, Toby, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'll start with that one. I don't know about the, the, the three to five key elements, but in terms of value drivers, 
And of course, 55,000 and two goes about defining value. But for me, the, the biggest value, it, it's the people, the processes, it's it's the better integration of your business that it can drive. And that creates efficiencies through the behavior and the culture and the leadership that you know then deliver the service or, or, or the return on investment. Um, we've seen some real improvements in government agencies, particularly in the way they work together across their organisation, simply through starting a conversation around asset management and the processes and practices that, 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 that it, the standard is looking for you to have in place. So for me, the, the biggest driver around value is just simply improving your business. Anybody else? Tiffany, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, actually, in the transit and rail space, I would say that regardless of whether they're adopting ISO 55001 and, and certifying against it or aligning to it, there are some some major benefits and that they are um, that they're realizing around improved safety, increased efficiency, improve reliability, and definitely improve performance in a quantitative way. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, next question, can companies still benefit from following the framework but not get accredited? Um, um, maybe, is, is Wayne available? If not, I'll... I'll try that one, Chris. Yeah, there you go, yeah. <laughs> uh, the joys of the internet. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, so the vast majority of organisations globally actually are, look, are looking to align to the standard more so than be certified. Of course, we don't have exact numbers because we don't we don't uh, we don't uh, track that individually. But certainly, from my experience and other experience of my colleagues, we spend a lot of time working with organisations, um, uh, helping them to understand asset management, and many of them choose to align rather than go for certification. In terms of the benefits that are gained from it, equally equal benefits are gained from it, um, whether they certify or whether they align. Uh, the benefits uh, that they generate um, are such that they want to continue to sustain and improve regardless of being certified. So yeah, there's, globally, there's, there's almost certainly be more organisations aligned than certified. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd also add, I think, that there is a real benefit in not just reaching that point where you are aligned or able to be certified, but in the journey from where you are today to that point. So those organisations that are starting to look at the the standard um, and that may be thinking well it's three to five years before we're going to actually have uh, be, be fully aligned to this it's not going to be three to five years before you start seeing those benefits those early stages of understanding your business understanding what your goals and objectives are and understanding the challenges and risks that you have in achieving those um, and how you will attack that um, really are um, some of the key benefits from the ISO standard. Um, I have another question here on digital transformation. Um, how do you see the standard and digital transformation aligning over the next three to five years? Um, I'll maybe ask Toby or Tiffany to start with that one. I, I might I might start with that one, Chris. So for me, this is an interesting question because it, it depends how you're defining digital transformation and what that means to you. Um, I think often we, we go straight to the digital transformation around information, data and uh, and the like, but to me, it, it's more about the technology and the digitization potentially of the processes you have in place. And you know, rather than having printed out documents, how do we make uh, asset management for the business more interactive, more dynamic? Um, perhaps the strategic asset management plan, rather than being this sort of te technical thing describing your business and translating your objectives, perhaps that sits on the internet and it's, it's something you interface with. So for me, that's more around the application of technology to, to, to the business problem. And I think that is something that has, has got to come. Um, it's got to be, it's got to make it more relatable and, and, and have asset management become more and more digitally part of your business. Yeah, and if I can add on from that from a standards perspective, there's definitely opportunity to um, to align and incorporate that into the next um, update of 55001. It's actually great timing. We are currently in the process of uh, reviewing and revisiting that standard. Great, thanks, Tiffany. I think from my perspective, um, from my perspective, I certainly see digital transformation not as a focus on technology and not as a focus on information but more of a focus on how we utilize those uh, emerging tools to improve business performance and we do that by directing it at the challenges of the day and making sure that we're aligning 
our approaches to our organizational goals and objectives and and so asset management really does then give us a a roadmap it gives us a a methodology or an approach in which to um, focus how we adopt digital transformation into the workplace and how we use those tools to drive performance Wayne do you have anything to add on that I think I heard you yeah I, I do Chris just to add to that there, there are certain um, uh, products or, or subsystems of asset management which will lend themselves uh, uh, nicely to digital transformation around risk and, uh, and intervention planning and performance monitoring uh, and, and so the standard provides, I suppose, a framework for digital uh, products and systems to be aligned to and integrated against. So I, I think, as Tiffany has uh, indicated, that the standard could look to bring some of these things to life um, by, uh, I suppose, looking at the linkages between them and uh, create that would create great, great opportunities for digital transformation in this, in this area. Thanks, Wayne. Um, so we have one last question, and if I'll just, as I read this one out, if anybody else has got any more questions, now is your time to type them in. Last question is, what are the key differences between asset management and facility management? Um, I'll maybe make a start on that and then ask the others to chime in from their perspectives. I do think there is always a definition component to these, these types of um, questions. And from us, from our point of view, and indeed from the international standards point of view, asset management really is defined as the um, company's approach to how they're extracting value from their assets. And, and the ISO standard um, makes it quite clear that when we talk about a company's assets, we're talking about both the intangible and tangible assets, so the physical and non-physical assets. Um, and it's a company-wide approach. Facilities management is more focused on the um, on how we are providing service to business operations, and that tends to focus more on the utilization of facilities for um, to provide office services, for example, in order for an organisation then to um, utilise their staff to deliver customer service, whether that be um, the Facebook type organisation, which is less about delivering physical assets but more about delivering a service or whether that be more of a, a transit or a, a power um, organization uh, agency where they are where their staff in those facilities are then um, managing lots and lots of other uh, facilities fleet and infrastructure to deliver customer service um, Wayne or Toby do you want to talk a little bit about how you would define that within um, Australasia? Uh, if I may, uh, Chris, yeah, I think uh, just along the lines of exactly what you've, you've said, for me, asset management is about um, the, the organisation. It's about understanding why you have the assets and, and also the systems for managing the the assets. For me, I then see facilities management as, as being actually the managing of the facility uh, and, and therefore the, the piece within it. You can also have, um, I guess, the management of the asset within the asset management view in the same same sort of way. Um, Wayne? Yeah, if I just add to that in a small way, um, asset management is about creating value and one of the value outcomes might be we don't need the assets. We can deliver this another way without the assets. Yeah. Um, and facilities management says we've got these assets we will maintain them and we'll do something we'll operate them um, asset management stands back from that and says do we even need these things in the first place and facilities management doesn't quite do that Toby yeah. I thought you oh sorry <laughs> go on, Tiffany sorry I was just going to add on to Toby's point because he he raised a really great point about the difference between asset management and managing assets so I, I just wanted to point out to everyone on the line, there's a really great white paper on this that whether you're you're asking about facility management or management of any other type of assets, um, there's a really great white paper that's available. You can also access it on the TC251 website. Great, thank you for that, Tiffany. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I don't think we have any other questions, just scrolling here. No, that looks like all of them. Um, do any of the speakers have any questions? If not, we will pull this to a close. No. 
Good. Well, listen, thank you everybody for dialing in today. I know for some of you, for those in the United States, it would have been very early, um, but uh, on, it is World Standards Day as we introduced from the start, and we are delighted to continue supporting um, standards, including the International Standard for Asset Management, Management Systems. Um, we've had a, a ongoing role supporting that um, since its inception, and, and we're delighted to carry on doing that. That is, in my mind, WSP's commitment to helping to drive and promote good industry practice and making sure that um, the world in which we all live in is indeed protected by the standards from which we develop. Um, with that, I'm going to call this uh, webinar series, uh, this webinar today to a close. The series continues. We have um, a number of other webinars over the next um, month or so, so please do check back and check our website, et cetera, for future webinars. Thank you to all of the speakers uh, and have a good day, everybody. Thank you.